I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. So this wonderful concept called neuroplasticity. Mm. So remember we were taught when we were young, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. No, no, no. We can teach an old dog new tricks. This book could have been called The Lazy Person's Guide to Health and Longevity. I am the lazy person. If you're going to lose weight, then the best thing to do is not to make enormous sacrifices. Eat everything you like, but eat it slowly. If you eat a donut every day, eat a donut once a week. So this is breaking news. Sanjeev Chopra, I am so glad you're here in the studio. You're the author of The Big Five, Five Simple Things You Can Do to Live a Longer, Healthier Life. Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be in the studio with you, James. And, you know, you've been on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. People said to me, oh, well, what's he done? Well, Harvard Medical School. Everybody just shut up. (laughs) And your brother's Deepak Chopra. You've worked very closely with him over the years. He's obviously written many inspirational books. But I think you've always focused, you know, just going back through your books, you've always focused on the more medical, the more scientifically proven. There's a ton of research. When, When you list your five items, there's a ton of research. It's almost so much research. I got like bogged down in all the research, but it's, it's good to kind of prove um, because some of these things are controversial. So it's good to show the scientific basis behind each of these things, and then it's not just your opinion. Absolutely. So, James, I've been privileged to be a physician for about 45 years and on the faculty at Harvard Medical School for about 35 years, and I've seen patients from all over the world. I've had brilliant colleagues, many of them Nobel laureates. So I've learned a lot of medicine over the years. My specialty is hepatology or liver disease, And I got intrigued about uh, one of the topics in this book, which is on coffee, some 25 years ago when I saw a publication and it said coffee drinkers have lower levels of liver enzymes. And that's my field, hepatology. So that's why I got interested in it. I started collating all the data, looking at all the scientific research. And that was, I think, the impetus for writing this book. Yeah, and it's it's fascinating. So I'm going to list the 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 five really quickly, and then we'll talk about each one, okay? Sure. Because what I like about these five and the fact that you're a medical doctor is that these aren't five things I need prescriptions for to go to a store. I think doctors have this tendency to overprescribe, you know, pharmaceutical medication. These are things. I mean, since I read this book, because I read an advanced copy, all I've been doing is these five things. Wonderful. <laughs> um, and honestly, like, so your first one, which is amazing, is coffee. And I love coffee, but I've limited myself for years to two cups of coffee. Yesterday, I have to admit, I drank seven cups of coffee after <laughs> reading your book. Then you have the mysterious case of vitamin D, which I have a big question for you about that. Then, of course, you have um, exercise, but the title is called uh, Run or Walk for Your Life. 
Then you have nuts, and I have an important question for you there. And then you have meditate once a day or twice. But first, I want to. Um, I bought you a bag of pistachios here. Wonderful, thank you. I'm going to start eating these because you know eventually. I, I saw you mention this cures erectile dysfunction issues, and who knows? I'm getting older. Who knows when that could start happening? I don't want to take Viagra. I'd rather take pistachios. So um, let's talk about coffee first. So coffee, it was amazing to me. You mentioned it's not just the caffeine because you compare coffee with tea, but you mentioned how all the antioxidants that are in coffee, and it's so much more than many fruits and vegetables, or even like an entire serving of fruits and vegetables. Tell me more about that. Like what else? And I mentioned this to people over the weekend. Most people didn't even know that coffee has anything other than caffeine in it. Yeah, so that's great. So coffee, especially regular coffee, has more than a thousand constituents. Coffee is now the number one consumed beverage in the world. About 2.25 billion cups of coffee are consumed every day. And amongst those constituents, there's something called caviol. There's another item called... How do you spell that? K-A-H-W-E-O-L, caviol. And then there's something called cafestol, C-A-F-E-S-T-O-L. And if you take an animal and produce liver injury by giving it a chemical, a toxin, and you get profound liver injury, now you repeat the experiment, but this time the animal that gets caviol or cafestol, the animal that gets the toxin is pre-treated with caviol or cafestol. It totally abrogates the liver injury. So drinking coffee, I will absorb those those ingredients? Those constituents. What else? What else and, is in coffee? And it also contains chlorogenic acid, which is one of the richest antioxidants. Well, and, and by antioxidant, is right. that an overused BS word or is it real? I think it's overused in the sense that we are sold a bill of goods about supplements that uh, that you can go to GNC or go to a store, a vitamin store, and, and buy these supplements. And there is very little data, to my knowledge, that if taken in that fashion or that form, that they are beneficial for our health. So, so, so all of these, if they are naturally right, if they're in fruits, they're in vegetables, if you're taking it in coffee which uh, I think of as a magical pill because it has so many, so many health benefits. And then you see the benefits. And so, okay, so coffee, though, is also known to uh, induce stress, higher cortisol levels. Uh, could that be unhealthy? If I mean, you mentioned even like Voltaire drank 70 <laughs> cups of coffee a day and lived to 83, yeah, which right. is very impressive, but... If I drink 70 cups of coffee a day, I would kill myself. Yeah, so I agree. James, what I say to my friends and colleagues and patients is drink two to four cups of uh, regular coffee a day. Oh, if, so I if, really screwed yeah. up by drinking No, seven. you didn't screw up. <laughs> I, I, I dr sometimes drink five or six cups. Once in a while, that's fine. I don't drink after five o'clock because I will not be able to sleep that night. So after I'm, five, like I usually try to stop by noon yeah, because it has a kind of a 12 hour. You, you mentioned it's a six hour half-life, which yeah. still means it's in the system 12 hours later. That's true. And everyone is different. Everyone's physiology is different. I have friends maybe a few years younger than me. We go out for dinner and they're having a double espresso at nine o'clock. And they say Because I guess it helps digestion. It might help digestion. Mm -hmm. But more importantly is its effects in preventing liver disease, cirrhosis of the liver, low risk of five cancers. Five common cancers, four in men, four in women. So primary liver cancer is now the third leading cause of cancer mortality in the world. Now, does liver cancer normally come from too much alcohol consumption? No, that's one of the reasons. So mm -hmm. alcoholic cirrhosis leads to liver cancer. And here's the interesting thing about that. For, for decades, we were mystified. How come there are some people who drink a pint of whiskey a day? or a liter of wine a day for 20 years. And then at the end of 20 years, only 20% becomes cirrhotic. So cirrhosis is where there's complete distortion of the liver architecture. Islands of liver cells are totally surrounded by scar tissue. Then it leads to liver failure and the likelihood of liver cancer and the need for a liver transplant. And it turned out that the explanation is coffee. So if you drink that much alcohol, a pint of whiskey a day, a liter of wine a day, but you drink one cup of coffee a day, 20% lower risk of developing alcoholic cirrhosis. Mm. Two cups, 40%. Four cups, 80%. Wow, so basically if you have four cups of coffee, you're not going to get 
cirrhosis of the liver, yeah. even if you drink. Now, that's not a license to drink that heavily, right? You can get Korsakoff psychosis, cardiomyopathy, pancreatitis. When you say drink, you mean alcohol in this case? In that extent, yeah. Ex- yeah. about alcohol, one liter of wine. Oh, I'll drink coffee and protect my liver. Yeah, you'll protect your liver, but you could get Korsakoff psychosis, cardiomyopathy, pancreatitis, lose your job, kill people on the roads. Not to mention every girl looks beautiful in the bar, <laughs> and that's a problem. Right, right. But, but um, uh, what about... Uh, you know, the addictive aspects of coffee, do I, in order to have the same effect on, you know, let's say all these health benefits, do I have to drink more and more? Will withdrawal actually increase my ability yeah, to get Yeah, so that's disease? a very good question, James. So I don't think we develop tolerance. So if I have four cups of coffee a day, I'm perfectly happy having four cups of coffee. It doesn't and what mean about after, the stimulation? Don't, you, don't we develop tolerance on the stimulation part of coffee? Yeah, to some extent in the sense that if we withdraw, so one time I was drinking eight cups of coffee a day and my wife said to me, isn't that too much? And I said, you know, you're right. And I cut down to two cups. I did it right away, which was not a smart thing to do. And the next day at seven o'clock, I crept into bed. I thought I had the flu. I had aches and pains. And you yelled headache, at her. <laughs> you know, and uh, luckily I didn't yell because I meditate. <laughs> and uh, uh, then it hit me that this was caffeine withdrawal. So four cups is good. I think uh, people who have irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea or have horrific reflux, we call it gastroesophageal reflux disease, heartburn, those people should be careful because it may trigger heartburn or it may produce more bowel discomfort. Well, well, so... If I withdraw, though, it, well, you also mentioned insulin sensitivity. That right, you know, right. that co- coffee is good for diabetics. Like black yeah. coffee is good for diabetics. Yeah. If I withdraw, will it um, reduce my ability to fight diabetes? Or if not, if I withdraw, but if I even just maintain the same level? Yeah, if you maintain the, the same level, you will not develop tolerance in terms of insulin sensitivity. So, so coffee you have to is increase. Insulin. No, you don't have to. Mm-hmm. You will not develop tolerance. Oh, oh. So you'll at the same level of coffee, you'll still have the same benefit. So you've heard of type 2 diabetes. It's the burgeoning epidemic in our country related to obesity. In that condition, the pancreas still makes insulin. But the cells that normally respond to insulin do not. That's called insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Coffee does the opposite. It's insulin sensitizing. And And it turns out decaf has the same benefit for diabetes. Is that because it's not the... So caffeine, I imagine, is the addictive component of coffee. Is it because... uh, Is the... Uh, you know, the insulin sensitivity, is that related not to the caffeine but to other components of coffee? Absolutely, because tea does not have the same benefit. Coca-Cola does not have the Uh, same benefit. I see. So that's why uh, just maintaining the same rate, uh, it's not not related to the withdrawal or the addictive qualities of coffee. Correct. Correct. Very interesting. What about, I mean, in a lot of these chapters, and I I forget now if it's in the coffee chapter, but a lot of these chapters in this book, you mention... um, all of these things of the the top five uh, help with things like Alzheimer and dementia. Right. The, the reason I ask is when I did I did the twenty three and Me test, you know, about yeah. the, my did my genetic testing, right. and I have I guess the gene that doubles your chances for early onset Alzheimer's. So I'm always interested in the kind yeah. of easy. Uh, and by the way, I want to take a one tangent when I say easy. Your brother gave a really great <laughs> um, blurb for the book. This book could have been called The Lazy Person's Guide to Health and Longevity, Deepak Chopra. I am the lazy person. He's <laughs> referring that to me. So I want The Lazy Person's Guide to Avoiding Alzheimer's. Yeah. Will coffee help me? So coffee uh, appears to lower the risk of Alzheimer's. The other thing that does is it exercise. The third thing that does is, is vitamin D. So three things that I talk about in the book do it. And the fourth thing is learning something new. Mm. And it doesn't mean that you, you should play chess or Sudoku. If you keep doing that or doing crossword puzzles, you'll get better at doing crossword puzzles or playing better chess. It's learning something new on a frequent basis. That could be a language. It could be ballroom dancing. It could be putting and chipping in golf. The moment we do that, we lower the risk of developing Alzheimer's. So this wonderful concept called neuroplasticity. Mm. So remember, we were taught when we were young, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. No, no, no. We can teach an old dog new tricks. And you can actually develop neuronal connections by doing things that you're doing for the first time and learning something new. So as long as you're activating new parts of the brain, exactly. then that kind of fights off. Yeah. If one area gets the yeah. plaque or whatever, yeah. then yeah. other areas can light up right. and, and reconnect. Yeah, so the plaques are critical 
Uh, but what's probably more, uh, even more important is the inflammation that occurs in response, the inflammatory tangles that occur in response to the plaques. And there's a ton of research going on in, in this field. So we have a colleague at Harvard Medical School. His name is Rudy Tanzi. He's actually written the book with my brother, Super Genes, Genes Beyond Genes, a New York Times bestseller. And he has discovered most of the genes for Alzheimer's. Mm. Uh, he may well get the Nobel Prize in medicine or physiology for that discovery. He also, by the way, performs with Aerosmith, with it's Steven hearing. Tyler, who was one of my patients. And I can talk about him because Steven Tyler wrote about it in a book that he wrote, Does the Noise in My Head Bother You? So what did you treat him for? Uh, I treated him for chronic hepatitis C. And I treated him, uh, at that time, the success rate, cure rate was 30%. And his liver disease was getting worse. And he has about two pages in the book about me and how we discussed it and then how I treated him and how he actually got cured. It's the one chronic viral infection in human beings that we can cure. And how, how did you cure it? At that time, we were using a medication called peg interferon, uh, interferon injection given once a week, and a pill called ribavirin with horrific side effects. And, and But he was in the 30% that got cured. Wow, that's great. Well, congratulations yeah. on that. But did he start drinking coffee? Yes, I hope so. I, I hope he's drinking coffee. And now, here's the other interesting thing, and this is mind-boggling, that peg interferon and ribavirin had a 30% cure rate. But if people drank coffee, they had a higher cure rate. Really? Interesting. This, this study was published in Gastroenterology, the premier GI journal. Why do so many people have a negative feeling about coffee? Like people even tell me, oh, I stopped smoking and coffee, as if they were kind of equivalent. Yeah. So I think uh, there's often a refrain from primary care physicians, even if they've heard something. Like they hear this podcast and then next week they go to see their primary care and they say, you know, I heard this guy. I think he was from Harvard Medical School. He's an author and he's a professor and he said coffee is good for you and you should drink four cups of coffee a day. The usual refrain from primary care doctors will be these studies come and go, everything in moderation. And that's why in this book I have at least 30 or 40 references in peer-reviewed journals about the health benefits of coffee. Well, again, and there was also, James, there was an article about 30 years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, number one medical journal, and it suggested a link between coffee consumption and pancreatic cancer, mm. which is one of the deadliest cancers. And so a lot of people read that, at least doctors and maybe patients. It was in the lay press. In the next six months, it was debunked with multiple articles in the same journal. And there was a flaw in that study, which only in retrospect, the editors picked up. Mm. But that has stuck with a lot of people. You know, cancer, coffee is their link. But it lowers the risk of primary liver cancer, endometrial cancer, skin cancer, colon cancer, and metastatic prostate cancer. Just think about that. 50% reduction in metastatic. That's the bad prostate cancer that goes to the bones and can kill people mm. by drinking coffee. Let me ask you a question. This is off to the side of it, but it's related yeah. to what you just mentioned. I'm 48 years old. Yeah. I honestly haven't been to a doctor for a checkup since I was 18. Um, should I get checked for prostate cancer? <laughs> It's actually a very controversial subject because the way one is tested is by a rectal examination. To, and they check the size of the prostate, make sure there's no nodule. If there is, then there's a special ultrasound or MRI of the prostate that's done, but also a blood test called PSA, prostate-specific antigen. And there are a lot of concerns about the utility of this test. A lot of people with prostate cancer will die with prostate cancer because it's not, very slow growing. Very slow growing. Not off prostate cancer. Mm. So now people are measuring the PSA and then measuring the PSA again a year later and seeing the slope or the velocity ah. of the increase. And then those people get more tests, including sometimes multiple biopsies, which can be painful. So primary care doctors, many of them will order a PSA, others will not. If you're concerned, there's a family history, you don't drink coffee, then you may want to get a PSA. But if you drink f four cups of coffee a day, there's no family history, I wouldn't worry about I'm it. I'm doing five to seven for the yeah. next few months just to see. <laughs> but I am worried about kind of stress and anxiety that yeah. coffee does tend to cause a little bit. Yeah. So what coffee can do is uh, the adverse effects I mentioned, heartburn and diarrhea, but also tremors, insomnia, 
and uh, two millimeter increase in blood pressure can happen if you drink a lot of coffee. Uh, the anxiety, I'm not sure because some people actually find it extremely relaxing to have a coffee. Mm. There are people with migraine who drink coffee and it relieves their migraine. Mm. And think of migraine being one of the most stressful conditions, right? And they actually get better. What about the, you know, coffee is very uh, acidic. So yeah. if I'm drinking coffee, do I need to balance it? And I'm I'm talking like I don't know, I don't know what I'm talking about, but do I need to somehow balance the acidity with some alkaline parts of my diet? Or? You don't unless you have a proclivity for heartburn. Hmm. So at the lower end of our food pipe, we have a sphincter. It's called the low esophageal sphincter. And its only job is to remain tight and closed. And the moment I put something in my mouth or you put something in your mouth and start to initiate the act of swallowing, it has to open. The moment the bolus goes into the stomach, it has to close. Many of us, as we age, that sphincter gets incompetent. It remains open or it relaxes inappropriately. If this was a a valve made by GE, there'd be a recall, Mm -hmm. right? So that's what leads to heartburn. And it turns out decaf coffee has the same effect as regular coffee in terms of heartburn. So it's not the caffeine that stimulates acid secretion in the stomach. Mm. It's from the peptide present in the roasted grains from which the coffee is made. And that peptide stimulates the release of a hormone in the stomach called gastrin. And gastrin mediates acid secretion. So people who have horrific heartburn, we say, don't drink coffee, don't drink regular or decaf, don't eat pizza, don't eat mint, don't overeat, don't have chocolate, alcohol can make it bad. But that doesn't mean you should avoid these things totally. And, you know, you can't ruin your life and well, avoid these. Balance, and then you though? can take something called Nexium or Prilosec, which are very powerful medicines to counteract acid secretion. Okay. Um, I want to go to the next thing, which let me pull up my notes on this because there is so much stuff in in every chapter. Um, vitamin D. Right. So here, um, so vitamin D, you, um, maybe list some of the benefits and then I have a bunch okay. of questions about this. So vitamin D is called the sunshine vitamin. Even though we call it a vitamin, it's actually not a vitamin, it's a misnomer. So it's actually a hormone. And we produce vitamin I never heard D. of hormone. Yeah. So it's, it's a hormone that is produced by the skin when we're exposed to the sun, hence the sunshine vitamin. Then the liver converts D1, vitamin D1, to D2. And the kidney converts it into D3. And that's the active ingredient. It's turning out that uh, it's an epidemic of vitamin D deficiency in our country in all different countries. I was in Singapore and India recently teaching, and my colleagues, physicians said, we are seeing tons of vitamin D deficiency. A cardiologist in India said to me, Sanjeev, we've done a study, 90% of Indians in this sample were vitamin D deficient. Okay, so I have a problem with that statistic because in India, A, people tend to wear, they're more exposed to the sun. They have more skin showing in many cases compared to someone in the Northeast United States. And the sun is just burning bright. (laughs) All yeah. day, except for the rainy season. Yeah. Rainy season. Yeah. So, why would India have more vitamin D deficiency, uh, or as a much great, as the it's US? It's a great question. It's a great question. Couple of reasons: dark-skinned people absorb less vitamin D from the sun. So, mm-hmm. if you're dark-skinned, you absorb less. Number two, there's a lot of pollution in India. We're not even mm-hmm. sure if the ultraviolet rays are reaching us, right? Number three, people are putting sunblock. So the skin doctors have done a great job scaring the heck out of us. We have now young kids playing soccer in Florida who are turning out to be vitamin D deficient. Wow, because of the skin Because of the sunblock. Sunblock. So it's good. Put sunblock. But what I say to every person, check one vitamin D3 level once. And if you're deficient, you need to take 50,000 international units every week for three months to get up to a normal level and then take a maintenance dose. If you're sufficient you should still take extra vitamin D. I take 4,000 international units every day. And I I have a question about that in a second, but what percentage of the U.S. would you say is vitamin D deficient? I don't know the answer to that, but there are certain diseases in which we should definitely, or conditions in which we should definitely uh, check for vitamin D. So young people growing up, the American Academy of Pediatrics has recently 
change the recommended dose of vitamin D to 600 to 800 international units from 400, mm. almost doubled it. Uh, women who wear veils, wear burqas, will not absorb vitamin D from the sun. People with a very common condition called celiac disease or celiac sprue. We teach our residents and fellows in medicine at uh, the hospital where I work, Beth Israel Deaconess and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Every patient has celiac disease unless proven otherwise. Mm. In other words, it can present with neurological manifestation, dental anomalies, liver disease, infertility, osteoporosis, diarrhea, malabsorption, protein manifestations. And it's a very simple test, a blood test called TTG antibody and serum IgA level. So celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, very common, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Every person should be tested for vitamin D. So so I have none of these diseases. Yeah. How can vitamin, more vitamin D benefit me? I, by the way, I never go outside. I'm totally yeah. inside. Yeah. So, so I you, probably am deficient. You may be deficient. So I was in Singapore teaching, and I had three colleagues with me. I was running a course there. The chairman of medicine at the Beth Israel Deaconess, the chief of hematology oncology, and a cardiologist. And on the plane, we started talking about vitamins, and I said, this is the only vitamin I, everyone should take. And two of them said, yeah, we take 4,000 international units a day. And the fourth, a senior cardiologist, said, Sanjeev, I don't take it. I said, Dwayne, when we come back from Singapore, go see your primary care, get a blood level check. He called me three weeks later. He said, you won't believe it. I said, what, seven, very low, five? He said, zero. <laughs> now, he's a cardiologist. He's busy, indoors working. If he goes to the beach, he puts sunblock. So it's very, very common. You should get one vitamin D3 level check. Well, but, but what's... So, and, so, and people who have high, that's the mm -hmm, question, yeah. question you were asking, people who have high normal levels of vitamin D live longer. Mm. Again, an article in a prestigious medical journal. It's good for our bones. It's good for our muscles. It's good for the immune system. Multiple sclerosis, you've heard about, mm. everyone's heard of MS, Right. It turns out it's more common in countries of a certain latitude where you see less sun. Mm. And now there's a recent article suggesting that even if you already have multiple sclerosis, this came out about two months ago, and I tweeted it. Uh, even if you already have multiple sclerosis, if you take uh, high doses of vitamin D, you have less chance of having a relapse. So... You know, and in terms of taking vitamin D yeah. as opposed to going out in the sun, which is the yeah. natural way to get it. Right. I have a, I have a story for you. So a friend of mine had, and this is going to sound weird, but he had a porta potty business, meaning yeah. there would be an event outdoors. Sure. He'd bring in the bathrooms, yeah. Yeah. and then when the event was over, he'd take away the bathrooms and clean up. Yeah. When he cleaned up, what he noticed was it was inside the feces of humans. It yeah. was all un undigested vitamin D pills. Like, the human system has a hard time digesting these yeah. supplements. Yeah. So, how do you take it in such a way so, that you so that's, can digest? That's a great question. I think um, what patients who take vitamin D should, you know, the question it begs is, what is the bioavailability of a pill or a medication that we take? How much of it is really absorbed and gets into our system, which is what we want it to do? So people who find that they uh, have undigested corn in their stool, you know the answer? They're not chewing it. Mm. They're swallowing it. Mm. So here there may be, you don't have to chew vitamin D, but if you uh, swallow it and it doesn't get absorbed and it's in the stool, then it's not the right pill. Get a different pill. So what pill would you recommend? I, I get it from a source called Vitamin D3 World, World? And, yeah, vitamin D3 world. And they are these very small pills, and it's very inexpensive, and they are 4,000. And I told you earlier, James, that I take 4,000, but actually I put it in my hand, and if there's one, I take one. If there are two, I take two. I don't bother. And, <laughs> and you don't one. chew it or anything. It's, I don't it's chew small it. enough that yeah. it gets absorbed. And the best way to know that you're benefiting, repeat a blood level. Mm. It was 20, now it's 40. Of course, that's what did it, right? You didn't change your diet, and it went up. And um, if I don't take supplements, how much time in... So I live in the Northeast, I live in New yeah. York. How much time in the sun should I spend, you know, in the summer months, in the winter months, and so on? Yeah, if you spend 45 minutes to an hour without sunblock, and it's a good, beautiful, sunny day without a haze, uh, you'll make a lot of vitamin D. Even if I just have, let's say, exposed arms and face? Even if you have. 
the greater the exposure, the greater. I have a friend, he's a cardiologist. He wrote a book with me. Mm. Dr. Chopra says medical facts and myths. His name is Alan Lotwin. And what he does, he takes a little bit of vitamin D, but he's an avid golfer. And so he plays a ton of golf in the good summer months, which is only six or seven months at the most in Boston. And what he does is for the front nine, he won't put sunblock. And for the back nine, he puts sunblock. So this way he's getting his vitamin D and uh, not incurring too much of a risk of skin cancer. And, and if you do that, if you're outside in the sun, do you still need the supplements? I think a blood level will determine that. Okay, that's interesting. So simple, right? Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. The next thing you have is uh, running and walking. And yeah. Just exercise in general. And I'm not, I'm not the biggest uh, exercise. I've never. I've, I'm what's called indoorsy. <laughs> I've never been like a big gym person. I've never really spent time outdoors. I mean, I try to do push-ups every day. Yeah. But it's not like I'm serious about exercise or running. I do. I do walk. I noticed when I. At one point, I moved from New York City to outside of New York City, and New York City is a very big walking city, and I almost instantly gained 20 pounds. Wow. When I moved back to New York City, I lost 20 pounds. Yeah. So, but clearly exercise is linked to obesity and other things, but just in general, what's the benefits, what's the downside? Right, so that's a great question, and, and you're absolutely right. I think you nailed it, that exercise or lack thereof is linked to obesity, Obesity leads to high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease. The most common liver disease now in Americans is called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Mm. And it's related to obesity and type 2 diabetes. 40 million Americans have this condition. 40 million? 40 million have why don't, this why, condition. Why isn't like every other person I meet then say, <laughs> oh, I'm dealing with my non-alcoholic fatty yeah, liver because, disease? Yeah, because luckily only 15% evolve into cirrhosis. Okay. And, and the cornerstone of treatment is weight loss. But obesity is also linked to about 20 cancers. And if you have any of these cancers and obesity, your prognosis is worse than if you don't have obesity. In women with breast cancer, exercise after their breast cancer has been treated leads to a lower recurrence. But let me ask you this. Let's say you're And we running- don't understand the mechanism. But let's say you're running for, let's say you're doing exercise for an yeah. hour and you burn off 200 calories. That's like trivial compared to what we eat per day. Oh, absolutely. So, so is, eating not, is eating less more important than exercise? Eating less is more important because you can be on the treadmill for 50 minutes an hour, burn 200, 250 calories, and then you have one toast and one Coca-Cola and you've already exceeded that amount in calories. Calories is not going to be the full answer. There's an amazing concept now in medicine. I actually give a talk on this topic. I gave it in Anaheim 10 days ago to 6,000 clinicians. Microbiome. And the title of my talk was Microbiome, Man and Medicine. So we have trillions of bacteria in our GI tract. Are they friend or foe? And it turns out they can be friend. It's been called the second human genome the inner bacterial rainforest. And this is the hottest topic now in, in medicine. One I love the that, the topics. inner bacterial rainforest. Rainforest. Very poetic. Is that? And, and here's an amazing study that occurred, and this may offer us insight into the treatment of obesity down the road. So there were four identical twins, all women, in Finland, where one twin was lean and the other was significantly overweight. So they studied the stool for the bacteria, the microbiome. And totally different in the four lean twins compared to the four obese twins. Okay, what does that mean? Interesting. But the publication appeared in Science. And the reason was the following part of the study. So they took genetically lean mice. And in their food, they mixed the stool of the lean twin. They remained thin, the mice. They took the stool of the fat twin, mixed it, and gave it to a bunch of these genetically lean mice they all gained 30%, 30% increase in body weight and developed insulin resistance. Wow. So in the future, there could be a pill that we could take that would contain the right bacteria. Here's my, uh, hypo- my forecast. In 10 years, you and I could go deliver a sample of stool. They'll understand our microbiome. 
and they say, James, for you, you should take these two probiotics. Sanjeev, you should take these three totally different probiotics to now get healthy bacteria and get rid of the bad bacteria. So not all probiotics are the same? No, right now, the probiotic industry is $31 billion industry in the world Mm -hmm. every year. And the proof that probiotics help is minimal. Antibiotic-associated diarrhea, a condition called pouchitis, you develop a pouch, surgeons develop a pouch after doing a total colectomy in ulcerative colitis, and that gets inflamed. Probiotics subside the inflammation. And a wonderful paper from Chandigarh, India, looking at hepatic encephalopathy. People with cirrhosis or comatose or confused, give them a probiotic, they give them a particular probiotic, they woke up. See, I always thought probiotics are great just for general um, digestive health. Yeah, I think uh, if if you take it and you feel that your digestion is so much more settled and you have much more energy, my recommendation is take it. Or if you really want to be sure, stop it after a month. Your symptoms come back. Take it again. Your symptoms go away. It's worth it. As long as it's not too expensive. But you're saying now perhaps personalized bio- probiotics yeah. based on based your on microbiome. Your microbiome analysis. Wow. Precision medicine. Just like, you know, every cancer has unique molecular signatures. So no two breast cancers, even the same type by the pathologist, are the same. And in the future, we'll have treatment. And hopefully it won't be chemotherapy or radiation. We'll look back and say, oh, my God, how barbaric was that? It'll be immunotherapy. Just enhance our immune system, knock these off, but it'll be precision. For you, it's different. For her, it's different. For me, it's different. So let's connect this to the exercise. Right. Like, does exercise kind of transform the microbiome I have? Like yes, how? actually it can. Hmm. So it turns out the way we were born, vaginal delivery or C-section, whether we got antibiotics in the first year of life, whether we live in rural Iowa or New York City, whether we live in India or America, Jet lag, whether we take something to reduce acid, proton pump inhibitors, Nexium or Meprazole, everything influences. Uh, whether we take yogurt, whether we take probiotics, they can all influence the microbiome. Now, the thing you mentioned about exercise earlier, I don't want to forget, and at the start you said, you know, the thing you liked about the book is that there are no prescriptions. I do have one prescription in the book. And that is when we see patients and they're overweight and they have diabetes, heart disease, liver disease, and we want to to get to exercise. The way to do it is to say to them, which is the exercise that you dislike the least? And say, oh God, I don't like to exercise. But you know, I could swim. I could go for a walk. Okay, you could go for a walk. Could you do it three or four times a week? Absolutely. Could you go for 30 minutes to 45 minutes each time? Yes, Dr. Chopra, I can do that. I take out a prescription pad with their name on it, with my stamp and signature, and I say walking three to four times a week, 45 minutes each time, number of refills, infinite. So, so And is, it works. And is that enough? Like, let's say I walk 45 minutes, three or four times a week, you know, forever. What does that, how will my life change as opposed to now? Oh, You'll have a lower risk of so many medical conditions, chronic conditions, and you'll live longer. You know, uh, our previous U.S. Surgeon General was somewhat overweight, and she decided, how can I tell people to exercise if I myself uh, am not living? Example of it, she trained. She did a rim to rim of the Grand Canyon. Mm. Wow. And she said, telling people to run and all of that is is difficult. You know, simply walk. Just walk. You mentioned a really fascinating thing in the book, uh, you know, that the benefits of walking are exactly the same as the benefits of running, not if you walk for the same amount of time, but if you walk for the same distance as you run. Yeah, isn't that amazing? I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I, I was surprised when I saw that study, and that's a very recent study in the last year. And I think running, uh, people do get a high. You know, the runner's high, they get the endorphins but it can be very badly addicting. And people can develop shin splints, they can ruin their knees, their ankles, their hips, their back, um, and yet they are addicted. They want to run another marathon again. Walking is so much easier. You know, now we have treadmills that have soft surfaces. They're much more expensive, but they're sort of cushioned, so you don't take a hit on your back or your joints if you're on the treadmill. What about the benefits of 
um, you know, different types of exercise like weightlifting? Yeah, so weightlifting, those would be good for developing muscles and core body strength. And that is good. That's good for balance. That's good if you're a tennis player, if you're a golfer, you're a squash player, it's good. But you don't have to do that. And you can have simple barbells. You know, now they sell these barbells where you can travel with them. They're collapsed. You get into the hotel room, you go to the bathroom, you fill it with water, and now you've got Hmm. five pounds or eight pounds of barbells, and you can do that in the safety of your room. So it's just you repetition know, then? Because uh, yeah. obviously five pounds is not a lot. Yeah. How much should someone like me, how much, how much repetition should I I think do? you start, if you haven't done it before, start with 10 or 15 and then slowly increase. What about push-ups? Push-ups are great, again. How many should know? I do a day? <laughs> it's you're my, you're my doctor right now. I you know, know, how many are you years. doing right now? Uh, I can do 100 a day right now. Wow, that's pretty good. I, I, I think the key here is to do it regularly. Okay. If you do 100 every day or 100, you know, five times a week, that's more important than getting up to 150, 200, than hurting yourself and, or not finding it interesting. Exercise is very boring. Yes, that's right? why I hate it. I, I hate it too. One way it works is to have an exercise buddy. So mm. they're two of my best friends, and we, we are friends because we're all golfers and we've traveled together different parts of the world. <clears throat> I exercise with them. I, I haven't done it recently because I have a very bad back and I'm going to have back surgery next week. But uh, for for years we did it. We would meet four times a week and meet at 6 in the morning, 6.30 at the club where we play golf and go downstairs to the gym. And we'd arrive there in the parking lot and say, thank God I'm doing it with you. I would never have shown up. Yeah. But you can't disappoint your friend. But people also have exercise buddies in Boston the exercise buddy is in California. And by email, they're saying, I, on my Fitbit, have done 8,000 steps today. How many have you done? And the guy responds, 7,000, but now I'm going to go for a walk and catch up with you. Well, okay, so that's a question. So Fitbit and all these wearables are getting yeah. so popular. How many steps should I do a day? I think around 10,000 is a good figure. Not easy to do it. That's a lot. Like, that's, that's a lot. Yeah, I my brother know. and my son have a competition. And they connect with each other virtually every day. And my brother will say, oh, Bharat, you've done 9,000. I've only done 7,800. I'm about to catch a flight. It's leaving from gate 35, but I'm purposely going to go the opposite direction to gate 17 and then walk to gate 35 so I can catch up with you. Okay, so this You know, is, we love competition. So this is breaking news. How many steps on average does Deepak Chopra do a day? I think he does about 10,000 to 12,000. Wow. Yeah, he, he also goes to the gym. He, he's got a personal trainer. He's very serious about it. Um, okay. Uh, big issue for me here. You, the next chapter is nuts and I like all sorts of nuts. Uh, I'm really glad you, you get, you list all the benefits that I didn't know it was going to be on your top five. You list yeah. all the benefits of nuts. Maybe talk about some of the benefits, but then I have some hardcore questions I have to ask you. Yeah, sure. So nuts, it turns out, uh, there's a lower risk of coronary artery disease, stroke, Nuts uh, lower LDL cholesterol. So we've all heard of cholesterol, and if you fractionate it, there's something called high-density lipoprotein, HDL cholesterol, low-density lipoprotein, LDL cholesterol. The more HDL we have, the better off we are. What increases HDL? Exercise. What else? Alcohol, in moderation, of course. One drink for women and two drinks a day for men. So alcohol healthy. could be a little bit healthy. Healthy. As long as there's no problem with liver mm -hmm. disease or it runs in your family, alcoholism, then of course you have to be careful. So it turns out uh, nuts lower the LDL, the bad cholesterol. That may be the mechanism by which they decrease the risk of heart attack and stroke. There's also a recent article that it may lower the risk of of uh, pancreatic cancer, mm. one of the worst cancers. Yeah. So nuts are packed with energy. They're often rich in antioxidants. A lot of people worry that nuts may cause me to increase my weight. And I'm here hearing about obesity and everything. One pistachio, and thank you for this gift. You're has, welcome. Although has, they're, they're salted. Does yeah. that ruin the effect? No. If somebody has hypertension, then they should avoid salted. Um, and the roasted, does that ruin it? No. Okay. So one pistachio has only four calories. I could have 25 of these slowly, enjoy it, and it's less than having a Coca-Cola or a slice of bread. But And if you have it 30 minutes before a big meal, you feel satiated. 
So you actually wind up eating less. Okay, but so here's one of my problems with with nuts. And again, I probably right. eat them every day. I really love them, and it's related to this issue. And maybe it's related to something you said earlier. I do. I have noticed that my digestion is not so good if I eat too many nuts, and maybe it's because they're too hard, so they're harder to digest or break down in the body. Yeah. So my key uh, uh, recommendation would be to eat them slowly and to chew it very carefully. Because you do, you know, you put, put two or three benefits. nuts in your mouth, and you chew one or two, and the next thing you know, you're swallowing, and one goes fully intact into the GI tract. And then that shell can't be broken and may come out in the stool and your digestion won't be that good. So don't eat too many. Like I feel sick after yeah, I eat, eat a too handful. Many. Yeah. Eat a handful. Like this, this to me is a little bit too much. I would have one third of this. So let's see. So this is one pack yeah. of net weight, 2.5 ounces. I don't know how many are yeah, in here. Yeah, I'd have like an ounce. All right. And that's plenty. Just what fits in your palm. You know, 20, 30 nuts maximum. Oh, I would definitely eat like five of these bags. So oh, that's, the problem. that's that's too much. Now, what I do is I carry it in the car, mm -hmm. and if I'm hungry and I'm commuting, I'll have some nuts. But as I'm going to my favorite Java shop to get coffee, I'll have some nuts. So, in the afternoon, if I need energy, would you recommend yeah, nuts? Absolutely. So, so you know, and and this, coffee. This is really this is also the other question. You kind of give almost I don't want to say a hierarchy of nuts, but you yeah. talk about cashews and almonds yeah. almost as like they're these wonder drugs. But you also lump in peanuts. And the one question I have, which you don't really mention in the book, peanuts are not nuts; they're legumes. That is true. And just like coconuts are not nuts, right? So, but coconuts and macadamia are very rich in saturated fat. Peanuts, we call them nuts. And everyone has termed it the lowly nut. There's a recent article that it has the same health benefits because this was the question being begged by people. Okay, almonds, walnuts may be more expensive, cashews. Can I actually have peanuts? And this article said the same health benefits. It's so funny because like you in consume the... nuts, you live longer. Even peanuts. Even peanuts. Because you know, but I... not peanut butter. I want to make that very clear. Not peanut butter. Right, because you say peanuts. it's filled, when it's in the store, it's filled with yeah. all the kind of saturated fats and, and sugar chemicals. and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> peanuts are, uh, nuts are good on some low-carb diets, but not peanuts. They separate them out. Why do you think that is? I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, the, the low-carb diets, they also tell you to avoid alcohol. They tell you to avoid coffee. Uh, I find that to be a very restrictive diet. I think if you're going to lose weight and you want to focus on your diet, then the best thing to do is not to sacrifice, make enormous sacrifices. Eat everything you like, but eat it slowly. Mm. If you have two slices of toast with your two scrambled eggs, have one slice. If you eat a donut every day, Eat a donut once a week. Reward yourself. You eat ice cream every day. Eat it once a week. Eat it twice a week. And that is, you're more likely to adhere to a diet like that. I have a physician colleague, my classmate. He's a nephrologist. He was very overweight. He decided 30 years ago to do two things. One is he swims. He swims three or four times a week for about 45 minutes. So he loves the exercise. He loses, burns some calories. The other rule is he'll never go back for seconds. Mm. No matter how tasty the food is, and even at a restaurant, he'll fill his plate and that's it. He eats slowly. You know, we've all had the experience. We go to a Chinese restaurant and you go out with friends and you order food and you say, my God, this ginger chicken is so good. Waiter, can we have another one of these? And then by the time he comes back with that, 10 minutes later, you're, you're full. And you say, why did we order this? Can you doggy bag this? So the key is that in 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes of having a meal, the brain has a center called the satiety center, and it's satiated. And it says, stop, you've eaten enough, right? But if we consume 2,000 calories before that happens, if you watch, next time you're at a restaurant, watch people eating there, and you'll watch that the people who are overweight and I, please, this is not condescending. It's an observation. I, I'm trying to help you. The people who are markedly overweight don't chew their food. Mm. They literally inhale it. They don't drop the fork in between bites. And you see the thin people, they're eating slowly. 
It's so it's so funny because a, a friend of mine, AJ Jacobs, who's also been on this podcast, he wrote a best-selling book called Drop Dead Healthy, and where he spent a year trying to be healthy. And one of his key recommendations, one of the key takeaways I had was between each bite, put the fork down. Put the fork down. And and eat a few nuts before the meal. Drink some water. You won't dilute your gastric juices by drinking a little bit of water with your meal, but you'll feel fuller. It's so funny because I think there's a Louis C.K. joke where, uh, you know, he talks about how how much you should eat, when you should stop. And he said, I'm not stopping. If there's food there, I'm <laughs> I'm going until there's no more food left. Yeah. So it's hard for sometimes people to tell themselves that. It is. There, there's, uh, you know, the... Highest percentage of people who are more than 100 years old are in a string of islands in Japan called Okinawa. And they have four or five things in common. So number one, they look out for their neighbor on either side. There's a social fabric. Number two, they walk. If they have to go half a mile to pick up a carton of milk, they don't get into their car. They walk. Mm. Number three, they eat a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. Number four... They have a saying, I think it's called Haka Haribu, which means when you're 80% full, push your plate away. Mm. We actually go for refills. And, and, you know, our parents may have told us, there are hungry people starving in the world. Finish everything in your plate. It's actually hung- better to push away when you're 80% full. But you'll be 80% full if you eat slowly. Mm. If you eat quickly, you'll have consumed those 2,000 calories. So, so on on the nuts, one more question. You talk uh, quite a bit about coconuts and the benefits of coconut oil, and I'm just curious. There's this kind of um, popularity lately of coconut water. Is yeah. that does that have the same benefits? You know, to my knowledge, uh, James, it hasn't been studied. Mm. Yeah, but uh, coconut, um, very popular in so many parts of Asia. It's getting more and more popular in this country. Coconut water is selling like crazy. Dentists are telling you to take coconut oil and put it in your toothbrush and brush your teeth with it and rinse your mouth with it. And that according to them, it changes the microbiome in the mouth. Mm. And it's good for you and you'll have healthier gums and teeth. Wow. Uh, but I think that research is in its infancy. Now, the the fifth thing in the book, uh, which I also strongly believe in, is is meditation. Primarily because it reduces stress throughout the day. It's relaxing. Uh, and you, in particular, practice uh, TM, Transcendental med- Meditation. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about the benefits of meditation. Right. So, you know, the, bene- the meditation itself is a beautiful experience. And sometimes you come out of it and you're so happy and you feel bliss and joy. But the major reason for doing meditation is to accrue the benefits in activity which is why the recommendation is to do it first thing in the morning before you go to work. And then ideally, you'll have time sometime around 4 or 5 or 6 in the afternoon or evening to do another one for 15, 20 minutes. And now your evening opens out. And how long in the morning? So I uh, have learned an advanced technique, and I do 30 to 40 minutes, but the basic technique is 15 to 20 minutes. And meditation will make you much more creative. It will make you much more happy. You'll have better interpersonal relationships. In your work, you'll find, oh, my God, there's so much more fluency, fluidity. I don't have to look at my notes when I'm lecturing. I speak better. I think better. I have better friends. More recent studies, so there are many benefits. A lot of them are subjective, right, how you feel. But objective, blood pressure, cholesterol, things improve. Your eating habits improve. You tend to drink less alcohol. You tend to smoke less or stop smoking completely. Very recent study, uh, groundbreaking in a sense. So at the end of my shoelace, there's a piece of plastic. At the end of our chromosomes, there's something called telomere. And there's an enzyme related to it, so it's called telomerase. And it turns out the shorter the telomere, the shorter the telomere, the greater the cellular aging. So if we have short telomeres, we're aging faster. And And is this a a genetic thing, the size of the telomeres? No, but here's what influences the size. So who has shorter telomeres? Mothers of chronically disabled children, Mm. victims of horrific trauma. 
caregivers of people with dementia. Mm-hmm. The person with dementia is clueless, but the person taking care of them, so sad and stressed, dying every day. And who has longer telomeres? People who exercise. People on the Mediterranean diet. And we think one aspect of the Mediterranean diet that's critical are the nuts. Mm. And the third one is meditation. Within four weeks, the telomeres increase in size. And So possible- Elizabeth Blackburn mm. is a scientist from Australia, works in California. She got the Nobel Prize in medicine or physiology for discovering telomeres. And is there a way medically to drastically extend the telomeres to extend life? That's being looked at now. Yeah, and, they, and again, be careful what you read in the lay press or in magazines because people will tell you, you take this product, I have this natural telomere product, plus. and your telomere will increase in size. Mm. No proof. Mm. We have to be very careful. Again, exercise, meditation will increase your telomeres. Well, I do want to highly recommend this book. As your brother Deepak Chopra says, this really is... The Lazy Person's Guide to Health. This will be my only guide to health is this book because it's it's real simple for me because I love coffee, love love nuts, all forms of nuts. Oh, on the nuts, what is the hierarchy? What is the best nut to consume? You mentioned Brazil nuts have selenium. Yeah, so, you know, uh, it really depends on what you like because some people say I have allergy to peanuts. Some people say I take almonds and I start to choke a little bit, but I can have walnuts. I have walnuts in that case. Walnuts also contain omega-3 fatty acids, which is the active ingredient in fish and fish oil. Mm. And if you don't like fish or fish oil, eat walnuts. Mm. Now you got omega-3 fatty acids plus the benefit of the nuts. And the easy way, James, to remember all these five is on a good sunny day like today in New York, 73 degrees with the sun out, go for a brisk walk. Don't put sunblock. Go to your favorite Java shop. Now you got the coffee, the exercise, and the vitamin D. Don't go nuts remembering this. And before you go, meditate. That's excellent. Well, what, what, uh, what books, in addition to your book, what books can you recommend for people who are just interested in this and want to learn more about, about health and these things and so on? So that's a good question. I'd have to think about it. I did write a book two or three years ago called Dr. Chopra Says Medical Facts and Myths Everyone Should Know. And in that, we have 36 chapters, but we also talk about many things, including breastfeeding and how it compares to uh, bottle feeding in, in infants and so on. So it depends. You, somebody could glance at the table of contents and decide, is that something they want to look at? Um, there is um, something called Up to Date, which is for doctors. Uh, I have to declare my potential conflict of interest. I'm the liver section editor-in-chief. And it's now subscribed to by 950,000 physicians in 150 countries. We're going to come out with a Mandarin translation. But it also has content for the lay public. Uh, If if, uh, your doctor subscribes to Up to Date, you can get a ton of information about so many common conditions written for lay people by world-renowned authorities. And they can print it in the office and give it to you. I think certain sources like Mayo Clinic, the Harvard Health Letter, those are very good sources for credible information. Uh, I'm not sure about other sources on the internet. People come to me sometimes and say, Dr. Chopra, but I saw this in print. And just because they saw it or heard it on TV, uh, it's not gospel. And please, please check uh, what are the credentials of the people writing that stuff or pitching that on TV. So on TV, you'll see a lot of stuff about cure for diabetes. There is no cure at the moment. Hopefully, we'll have stem cells. I think stem cell and regenerative medicine is one of the most exciting things in medicine. To me, it's the microbiome and then stem cell regenerative medicine. So make sure your source of information is credible. Well, um, and also, by the way, I want to recommend Brotherhood by you and Deepak Chopra. I thought it was a good memoir of growing up, the the two brothers, uh, and the kind of the divergent paths that you both took around the same areas of kind of health inside and out, but it was interesting to see the, the divergence. Um, but I do want to recommend uh, The Big Five by Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, Five Simple Things You Can Do to Live a Longer, Healthier Life, And thank you once again, Dr. Chopra, for coming on my podcast. This is great. James, a total delight for me. And all the best to you. Thanks. 
For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey, thanks for listening and supporting my podcast. I just want to let you know I have a new episode for you every Tuesday. And in fact, I'm thinking of adding more episodes per week. If you subscribe, you'll never miss one. It's really easy and it helps me a lot. Just go to iTunes, search for The James Altucher Show, and click subscribe. Thank you so much. I really hope you do this. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.